Hello and welcome to our training. Skills for effective parent advocacy. This information has been adopted from a curriculum created by the National Family Advocacy Support and Training Project from PACER Center. My name is Ryan Richards. I'm a parent advocate at Lynx Resource Center in the MATSU, and I will be presenting. Today, we're talking about effective parent advocacy. To be an effective, an effective advocate means to speak up for yourself or others to create a change. We'll also learn about skills that you need to be an effective advocate for your child and ways that you can make a difference. I hope that you will find one or more skills from this training that you can use to become a more effective advocate for your child with a disability. Use your power. Parents of children with disability often feel unheard, and it's easy to become frustrated with your child's school or other service providers when they don't seem to be listening. We have heard these phrases expressed by parents that we've worked with here in the Matsu. My child's school is not listening to me about my child's needs. My child's IEP has not been implemented and the school is not responding to my concerns. I feel my child is being over-disciplined at school. The school will not share necessary information with me and I don't know what else to do. Do you resonate with any of these frustrations? Here's a quote by Alice Walker. The most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. What does that quote mean to you? The goal of this training is to help make you aware of the power you have as a parent and how to use that power to be a more effective advocate for your child. I am here to help you learn skills to do this. Parents, you are the expert of your child and it's easy to lose sight of the power that you hold. You are the only one that can use this power for effective advocacy for your child with a disability. It might be difficult at first, but it is very important. You don't need to feel powerless or frustrated about your child's issues and obstacles. You can transmute your passion for your child into the power to advocate for them. I believe in you. So what is an advocate? An advocate is someone who speaks up on behalf of themselves or others to create a positive change. As we mentioned before, you are the expert of your child. You have already been an advocate. You just may not have used that label for your actions. Have you ever met with a child's teacher about any issue? Spoke at a local gathering about a project that you care about? Told a cashier that an item was not ringing up correctly? Well, if you have, you're an advocate. <laughs> As a parent of a child with a disability, you've had to speak on behalf of your child at some point or another to someone. Maybe it was a teacher, daycare worker, doctor, nurse, social worker, or other parents, relatives, or friends. So why should you be an advocate? Well, I can't stress it enough. You're your child's expert. <laughs> You're the best natural support for your child. Your experiences are val valuable and can be used to improve things. You know when something is or isn't working. You have ideas how to make things better. And you have the only long-term connection to your child. A natural support is someone in your day-to-day -day life that provides forms of support, such as parents, siblings, other family members, friends, or people in the community that you interact with naturally. Professional supports are people that have been trained and formally educated to provide specific supports and services, such as doctors, teachers, advocates, healthcare workers, administrators, or people that play a specific and professional role in your life. Both forms of support bring valuable experience and expertise to the table. But you, as the parent, you are the best person to speak up on behalf of your child 
You know the most about them. You know what your child needs and wants, as well as the future that needs to be created to ensure them a happy, productive, and independent life. Six skills to be an effective advocate. Number one, understand your child's disability. Number two, know the key players. Number three, know your rights and responsibilities. Number four, become well organized. Number five, Use clear and effective communication. And number six, know how to resolve disagreements. An advocate is a supporter, a backer, a believer, and a promoter. You can be all of these. In this training, I hope to help you recognize and expand your current skills so that you can become a more effective advocate for your child. I'm sure you already have many skills in the areas listed here. We'll go more in depth, and I will also provide you with some resources to learn more. Some things to consider are, what are your strongest areas? How about your weakest? What areas can you learn to be more effective in? Advocacy is much more important than playing a game. But for the sake of this training, some of the main ideas are the same. For instance, imagine you're playing a board game or a card game. These games have rules and the players need to know those rules in order to play. The players also need people or social skills to understand taking turns for concentration, for communication, and for managing their emotions to play with a straight face. What strategy or plan will you use to succeed? Of course, the social security program, your doctor's office, and your child's special education program are far from games, but they all have processes with rules that require social skills and the ability to resolve disagreements and provide solutions. Learning these rules and processes will strengthen your ability to effectively advocate for your child. So in other words, who is the star? Who are the players? What are the rules? What's your plan of action? What do you do when it's your turn? What do you do when you disagree? Skill number one, understand your child's disability. Why is this important? It's important to help you understand your options for raising a child with a disability, to guide you to ask educated and informed questions to create understanding about services and which services meet your child's needs. What does high expectations mean to you? For instance, you can expect to become a more effective advocate for your child. You can expect your child to participate in their own success. You can expect your schools, agencies, doctors, legislators, and other professional supports to partner with you. <clears throat> Assistive technology and accommodations can be key to learning and accessing services. Learn which specific assistive technology or accommodations best help your child learn. Are there AT methods or accommodations that help other children who have the same disability as your child? Explore the variety of assistive technologies, such as computers, voice simulators, hearing aids or FM systems, Braille, curb cuts, elevators, captions, note takers, and so much more. The list goes on and on. Use the word access, such as what will it take for my child to access this service or activity? A deaf individual may need a sign language interpreter. An individual in a wheelchair may need an elevator or curb cut. A person with a cognitive delay may need simplified direction all of these individuals need access to services and or accommodations in their learning environment. Getting to know other adults and individuals with your child's same disability is a great way to learn possible life outcomes for your child. A great local resource here in Alaska might be Peer Power. You can reach them at www.peerpower907.com. There are also disability groups, 
Lynx offers social groups for individuals with disabilities. Hearts and Hands of Care is one of our partners and they also offer day activities as well as Hab Academy. There are support groups, um, great family support groups that Stone Soup Group offers. And then here at Lynx, we have a Facebook group for parents of children with disabilities. Skill number two, know the key players. So why is this important for your family? Well, consider your case manager for social services or an IEP, state insurance commissioner, state and federal legislators, city council members, board members, medical directors, patient representatives, agency directors, supervisors, school, school administrators, and so on. In order to influence a necessary change for your child, you need to know who to talk to. Who's in charge? Who has the authority to finalize these decisions and create these changes? If you're not receiving the help you need from your current point of contact, who is the next person with more authority or a higher responsibility? Learning the hierarchy of these systems can and will help you contact the persons necessary to create the change your child needs. To find out contact information and names of these higher ups, you can ask for a list of service user contact information. You can look it up on the internet. You can search through resources at your local library. You can ask for the organization or service provider's staff directory. Or you can ask the staff at your local parent center, like links, for more ideas and contacts. It's helpful to know if the people you want to contact are public, nonprofit, or private employees, so you can better understand their role. Ask who funds their agency, service, or organization. If it's funded through public taxes, then they're public employees. Federal or state grant and donation funding will be a nonprofit. And most private organizations are funded by fees, donations, or earned income. Skill number three, know your rights and responsibilities. This one is important because sometimes knowing who's in charge is not enough. Parents need to know the rules of the game as well. It's beneficial to ask where we can find agencies, procedures, forms, policies, and sometimes laws and regulations in writing. Parents should practice participating from a position of knowledge as much as possible. Some practices for parents are, reading through agency websites to learn about services, policies, procedures, and regulations. Finding the funding sources of those agencies. Asking agencies questions about rights and responsibilities of the people who use their services. Joining parent support groups, peer support groups, or other groups related to your child's disability or taking classes related to your child's disability. How an agency or service is funded is directly linked to your rights and responsibilities as a service user. <clears throat> Agencies funded by the public are required to follow certain laws, not just policies. Publicly funded systems are supported by taxes and include public schools, all government agencies, and all levels of government, including cities and counties. Agencies that are funded by fees, donations, and grants are nonprofits. And private agencies are funded by fees, donations, and or earned income. Both of these agencies and services usually have policies. This is why it's important to know how an agency or service is funded. It's okay to ask about funding sources and to see these policies in writing. Most agencies have staff designated to answer questions regarding rights and responsibilities of the people who use the agency or service. It's good to ask who that employee is and obtain as much information in writing as possible. Rights Law is a great resource for special education and disability reading materials. You can access them at www w r i g h t s l a w 
www.ghanaparents.org. Our parent support group on Facebook has over 40 members that are parents just like you, all of which hold invaluable experience, information, and resources. It's a great place to connect and learn. Parents as partners. Parents and professionals can be partners. And they're both necessary for your child to succeed. Reflecting back on the Alice Walker quote, you do have power, you just need to use it. It's common that parents don't feel like partners or even players. It's important to understand the different roles and backgrounds of each participant. Some things to consider are, professionals have chosen their careers, while most parents did not know that they'd have a child with a disability. You'll be involved with your children for life. Most agency and service staff will be involved with your child for a much shorter time. Professionals have formal training and education and usually receive payment for their role in your child's life. Both you and the professionals have the same goal of providing appropriate services for your child. Parent knowledge and opinions are valuable. No one else knows what you know about your child. Only parents have an in-depth, long-term and daily relationship with your child. Parents can learn new skills to advocate and communicate clearly and assertively. Parents often have the power of giving or withholding consent for services. So when parents and professionals work together, they have the same overall purpose or goal. Partners want a win-win situation. They make effort to communicate clearly. They have respect for what each partner brings to the relationship. They have individual roles or jobs and a clear understanding of what those are. They have authority to make changes with the permission of the other partners. They have opportunities for giving feedback or soundboarding for one another. They bring different and unique skills and information to the endeavor. They are accountable for the results. They have problem solving strategies to offer as early as possible. And they don't focus on who was wrong, but what went wrong and how the partners can fix it moving forward. When you can effectively partner with a professional, agency, or service, your child will benefit and everybody wins. Casey Stengel says, it's easy to get good players. Getting them to play together, that's the hard part. Skill number four, become well-organized. <clears throat> In order to effectively work or partner with an agency, it requires documentation, data, records, et cetera. It's best practice to be well prepared by organizing what you do have. You never know what you might need in the future. So keeping record. Keep a record separated by service or agency. For example, school records may go into a special education record keeping folder, while health records may go into a health record folder. Keep written correspondence like printed emails from the school, social security office, public services, medical professionals, or any other system that you use. Keep a list of names and contact numbers for each system that you deal with. When you do go to a meeting, bring all the pertinent records from your file. Keep them in order by date or event so that you can easily find what you need. And put it in writing. As we mentioned before, it's always best to get as many things in writing as possible, including, but not limited to, copies of any letters or emails that you sent, as well as copies of letters and emails that you received from others. There is a saying in advocacy circles, if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. Or if it's doc not documented, it didn't happen. Someone may have told you something on the phone or in a hallway conversation, but it may mean nothing because it wasn't documented in writing. If that's the case, you can write a letter or an email saying something like, thank you for talking to me about this subject today. I think what you said was, and that you will, unless I hear from you in writing by next week, I will assume you understood the conversation same as I did. Something like this would be helpful down the road. Also keeping a phone log. It's important to keep a phone log. 
It should include the date, the name of the person you spoke with, and a summary of what was said or decided, as well as brief notes of what, it, of what was discussed. If there were any specific things that you or the other person agreed to, keep them in your log so that you can check back later for progress. Have a meeting notebook. In your meeting notebooks, include the date, who was there, and a summary or notes of what was discussed and decided. And just like the phone log, if there are specific things that you or others agreed to, highlight that for follow-up. Skill number five, use clear and effective communication. <sighs> Staying calm and collected is a key part of effective communication. Emotions are natural, and what you choose to do with those emotions will have a huge impact on how effective of an advocate you are for your child. If you show up to a meeting angry, that's all anyone will remember is that you are angry. Regardless if you had or made good points or posed valid requests, it doesn't matter. They'll just remember that you were angry. So instead of becoming angry, use those emotions to your advantage. Those big emotions simply mean that you have a passion for creating a positive change. Your emotions are your responsibility, no one else's. The only person you have the power to change is yourself. Some tips that can really make a difference when you're advocating for your child are keeping your eyes on the prize. The prize being effective service for a child with a disability. The focus should always be on your child and your child's needs, not yours. Listen and ask questions. Intentional listening to others will give you information that you need. Listen to see if they're sharing opinions or facts. Facts will be supported by data or record about what is being said. Decisions should be based on facts only. Whether you agree or not, Try to understand what others are saying and where they are coming from. If you are unclear about what you just heard, ask questions and then ask for supporting facts. It's okay to ask others to explain something to you in another way to ensure a clear mutual understanding. Always stay focused on the needs of your child. Do not get distracted by focusing on the service that you may want for your child. Use data and supporting facts instead of your opinion to back up what you think your child needs. It's better to bring the problem to the discussion table rather than the solution. This allows for you and the professionals to problem solve together to find solutions. Some tips about how to do this are, describe the problem clearly, encourage all members of the team to provide input, Brainstorm without evaluating ideas. Don't judge how good the idea is. Just list options. Choose a solution that you all agree upon. Develop a plan to execute the solution. Define who is responsible for which role and action, as well as when and how it will be done. Put the plan in writing and provide a copy for everyone involved. Create a timeline and criteria to evaluate success. And always follow up to make sure the plan is implemented. On the next slide is a great resource for diffusing emotions. Number one, I may be understanding. IEP meetings can get heated when there is a disagreement about how to interpret laws or test results. You can diffuse that by taking a step back and giving the school a chance to explain its position. If you're certain you're correct, don't worry, you'll get a chance to say so. A sample response. I may be understanding. Show me a detailed interpretation of that law. Here's the information I have on hand that speaks to the issue. Number two. I can show you. If someone tries to shut conversation by telling you they're not sure where your information is coming from, that's easy enough to diffuse. Simply show them. A sample response. I can show you where I've highlighted that information in the report and progress notes. 
Can we make each team member a copy? Number three, how can we work together to make this happen? <clears throat> it, can, <clears throat> it can be frustrating to say the least to hear someone at your child's school tell you it doesn't provide a certain service or doesn't have the staff to implement it, but the law is on your side. So make the conversation about collaboration. A simple response. How can we work together to make this happen? The law says services must meet my child's unique needs. And this is the recommended service. Number four, may I see a copy of the written policy? Someone from the school might say, this is how we've always done something. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a policy. Diffuse any arguments about it by asking to see in writing that this is how they handle the situation. A sample response. I understand this is how you do things. May I see a copy of the written policy that outlines this procedure? Number five, let's ask him to join us. Federal law states that the IEP team needs to include someone who is able to make decisions about staff and funding. But in practice, you may hear, I'm not in the position to make that decision. So instead of getting upset, get practical. Sample response. Is it Mr. Smith who has that authority? Let's call him and ask him to join us. Speaking clearly and directly helps others understand what you have to say. Providing specific examples and sharing your story will also create understanding. If you bring a solution to the table, describe why and how you believe that solution will help. Avoid making people feel defensive as much as it's out of our control. It's important to always be kind and respectful without judgment. Try not to criticize as it increases defensiveness and decreases the ability for the other party to listen. Provide positive feedback and praise as often as possible. When people don't listen, they're unlikely to do what was requested. Turn negatives into positives. Use strengths-based language. Instead of saying, he's always fighting, you could say, it looks like my child needs to learn some social skills. Consider something negative a person has said about your child and how you could rephrase that into a request for service. For example, when I was in grade school, I had a teacher tell my parents that I was odd. And then he went on to explain that by odd, he meant that I may suffer from overly defiant disorder. My parents laughed with him for a moment and then proceeded to ask for an example of a time that I displayed this behavior and how they could work together to reduce disruptive behaviors moving forward. They followed up on the situation by requesting a meeting with the principal and the teacher that I was also able to attend. The meeting was to keep everyone on the same page. We all made a plan together and the teacher ended the meeting with a huge apology to my family. What is something negative a person has said to your child? And how could you rephrase that into a request for service? Some tips for good communication at a meeting. The past few slides have covered most of these tips already. Stay focused on your goal, show respect and expect it from others. Manage your emotions, ask questions, rephrase for clarification and say thank you. Tips for written communication. As we mentioned before, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. It's always good to put it in writing or request copies in writing. Reasons letters may be sent include making a request, asking for clarification, clarifying what you yourself want to say, asking for a final decision, expressing gratitude or saying thank you, or to document a verbal discussion. Use this checklist when you write a letter or email to help you remember these important points. Letters should be sent to the person who can make a change, be dated and signed, Focus on one or two issues. Be no longer than one page. 
Set a deadline if a reply is requested. Give your contact information and always remember to keep a copy for yourself. When you disagree, well, disagreements happen. Here are some tips to move through those disagreements in a good way. These tips will help solve the disagreement more quickly and amicably. Remember, you can disagree without being disagreeable. Express that you wanna to continue to work together for the benefit of your child and that you do not want this agreement to interfere with that. It takes two to disagree. Sometimes you might be partly responsible for the disagreement. Accept responsibility for your part and apologize if and when it's appropriate. You advocate for your child only. The professionals you may disagree with work for an agency or service provider. They must not only answer to you, but to their agency as well. Oftentimes it's not the person that you're disagreeing with at all, but the agency. So separate the person from the problem. Each person involved in this disagreement brings different information, values, priorities, culture, et cetera, to the table. No one has all the answers. Try to work together using everyone's input to solve the problem. Help people make sure their facts are accurate so that decisions are accurate. Not everything is worth disagreeing about. Choose your battles wisely, or you and those you deal with can break trust between each other and become easily exhausted when trying to work together. Your child will not benefit when the adults are worn out by disagreements. Stick to disagreements that really affect the quality of service to your child. You might find that in doing so, minor disagreements will also be resolved or disappear altogether. Skill number six, know how to resolve disagreements. The informal process, talk to people first. Advocacy is just that, talking to people. Dispute resolution skills will be one of your strongest assets in advocating for your child. As a parent, you may disagree or agree with decisions made by an agency or service provider. Think back at skill number three you'll be reminded that knowing who is in charge is simply not enough. Remember, parents need to know the rules of the game too, including how disagreements are settled within agencies or service providers. Each agency and or service provider has a formal and informal guidelines on how it all works. Each agency has procedures, forms, policies, and sometimes laws and regulations, as we talked about before. It's okay to ask the agency if they have a dispute resolution procedure and where you can find it in writing. Familiarize yourself with this process before and during working with an agency or service provider. It's usually best to use an informal process to resolve your disagreement. Begin your efforts at the level closest to your problem. Talk to people such as the case manager, service provider, about your differences and be clear about why you do not agree. Remember to be kind. <clears throat> this is often the easiest way to solve a problem. Sometimes a compromise or trial solution can work. You may say something like, I really don't know if this will work, but we could try until and see how it goes. Formal processes. If the informal process isn't appropriate for your disagreement, sometimes a formal process is necessary to resolve the issue. Some options of formal processes may be mediation. Agencies and service providers sometimes provide mediation for the parties who disagree to meet with a neutral mediator. These parties, not the mediator, make the final decisions. The mediator simply guides the discussion so that all sides and options can be heard. Filing complaints. Some agencies and service providers have formal means of filing a grievance or a complaint. Familiarize yourself with this process beforehand. Filing an appeal. Some agencies and service providers have a written process for filing an appeal of a decision made by the agency or provider. 
government agencies must have an appeals process. In addition, insurance companies also have an appeals process if a claim or procedure is denied. To find out if an agency or service provider has a specific process that they follow to resolve disagreements, you can contact the service provider directly. You can research their website or utilize a resource specialist in your community. You may reach out to other people in your community that utilize the same service or agency by joining a group. Remember, there's a direct link between how an agency or service is funded and your rights and responsibilities, including resolving differences. Agencies and services often have case managers, consumer representatives, or patient client advocates. Utilize these employees when necessary. Skills checklist. We went over understanding your child's disability, knowing the key players, know and familiarize yourself with your rights and responsibilities, becoming well organized and maintaining it, using clear and effective communication, and knowing how to resolve disagreements. What have you learned? Is there a skill that you hope to improve? Do you need more resources? Do you need more support? Because we're here for you. <laughs> change begins on the inside. And the only person that you can change is yourself. No matter how much you wish others would learn some of these skills, you cannot force it to happen. You do have the power to change and grow yourself. As you learn and practice your skills, you may find yourself becoming more confident and effective. Through this process, you can and will make a great difference in the life of your child with a disability. As the saying goes, every journey begins with one step. Helen Keller said, I am only one, but I am still one. I cannot do everything, but, I, but still I can do something. I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. Thank you for joining us for this training on effective advocacy. We hope to see you next time.